Good morning, everyone. And again, welcome to Brookings. I'm Mike O'Hanlon. I have the privilege of welcoming Richard Spencer, the 76th Secretary of the Navy, to Brookings today. Uh, he really is a great American success story. Grew up in Connecticut, went to college at Rollins in Florida, majored in economics, served in the Marine Corps as a pilot, and then went to Wall Street, where he had a number of illustrious and accomplished positions. Also, a very active life in charity, including with Marine Corps Heritage Associations, uh, and then became as I say, Secretary of the Navy for the Trump administration, sworn in in August 2017. Since that time, he has also briefly served as the Acting Secretary of Defense and had the uh, responsibilities as well for the Deputy Secretary. So he's done it all. And would you please, without further ado, join me in welcoming Secretary Spencer to Brookings. Thank you, Michael. Um, it, it truly is. A, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, we'll talk about what the Navy's been up to and uh, where we are and where we're going, but I think I found one of our strategic uh, Achilles heels here in Washington, D.C., which is the traffic. So I sincerely apologize for being late, ladies and gentlemen. Time is one thing I talk about continually in the United States Navy, Marine Corps, integrated naval services, and it is not to be wasted, so I beg your forgiveness. Uh, the return to great power competition is testing our readiness and capabilities in ways we have not seen in quite some time. And what I'd like to do today is just talk to you about some of the initiatives that we have for year three, and then looking forward dramatically to sitting down with Michael and having a discussion, because uh, we need to talk about uh, a lot of things, to be very frank with you, to get it out uh, into your minds, because I am a firm believer that this is a team effort. Uh, we cannot do this as the integrated naval services by looking at our naval. Uh, we need your thoughts. We need thoughts from outside the wire, as I say. We need thoughts from inside all of government to do what we're doing. Um, this new power competition is really testing our role uh, and, and making us look forward to how we're going to adapt, react, and if we have to, fight. Uh, and it's going to be from the sea because the Navy Marine Corps team is your forward deployed away game. We have to be ready to fight tonight being a deployed team. We do not have the luxury of time in many cases. Uh, we are the power projection for the country. Uh, many call it peace through presence, but when we have to do our work, we will do our work. And I've said integrated naval force now three times. It's not Navy. It's not Marine Corps. Someone commented the other day at work, when I have a cufflink shirt, which is not that often, but when I do, one cufflink is the Navy logo, the other cufflink is the Marine Corps logo. It's the goal of my direction in complete concert with the CNO and the Commandant of the Marine Corps to have one single unified service. For those of you that have been watching the Navy and Marine Corps for many years, this is a big step in a new direction. We've always, quote unquote, fought together. Uh, being a Marine, there was always the line, yep, the Navy takes us to the next battle. Thank you for the ride. That attitude is completely eradicated at this point. We are going together where the installed Marine Corps team is a unique and elegant weapons platform for the Navy to do its job. So one plus one equals three. My mission is to guide us in the upcoming year to really achieve what I'm talking about right now. If you read the Commandant's planning guidance, and ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who haven't, please pick it off the web and read it. It is bordering on revolutionary. The Marine Corps will be trained and equipped as a naval expeditionary force in readiness and prepared to operate inside actively contested maritime spaces in support of fleet operations. CNO Gilday has the same thing in mind when he wrote, we fight and win as a team. We are greater when we integrate more closely with the Marine Corps, the joint forces, our allies, and our partners. We build capability with our most natural partner, tying more closely to the Marine Corps at all levels. You can see that the trident is all aligned in this goal. So there's no daylight between the services on this. We're moving forward as one, ready, lethal, and forward maneuverable team. That is the cornerstone, ladies and gentlemen, of our advantage. We must fund, equip, and prepare ourselves together at every, every echelon, every domain, sharpening the knife on both sides. I did not highlight enough the word fund. 
This strategy will be aligned through the palm. This is not just words we're putting on a board. We're going to fund for the strategy. We've already made significant strides through many of our functional elements and will continue to do so, innovating when we can, adapting where we must. And I see innovation and adaption as complementary strengths. Adoption adjusts to the environment. Innovation transforms it. To succeed in today's complex world, we must do both simultaneously. That's why I've tasked the department with strategic goals going forward in the third year, which enhance my priorities, but let me provide some more discussion on what I mean. One, we will invest in human capital. As I've stated since day one, when I took over, people are our most important and our most valuable asset. That is how we fight the ship. That is how we fight the weapon. Instead of assuming that our brand will attract all the right talent, our newly released human capital management strategy will meet the market where it is. We're looking to access the best people by employing technologies and best practices, both inside government, but equally important, those that have been evolved in the private sector. We'll augment our traditional workforce with outside experts, temporary employees, and we'll even go to crowd-based solutions. We're already experimenting in that area. And we'll curate our workforce, engaging our people so they understand the opportunities they have and the flexibility that we're going to provide them to build a career. You're not just going to be an employee in the Department of the Navy. We want to have a path for your career. Two, and we're well underway here, prioritize learning as a strategic advantage. Innovation and intellectual readiness have become the new battlefields where we describe in Education for Sea Power initiative as the cognitive age. And for those of you who have not read Education for Sea Power, which we throw an acronym on it, of course, it's called E4S, please do. It is an integral part of how the Navy Marine Corps team is going to progress. I've often said that we must be a continual learning enterprise for one simple reason. Our adversaries are doing the same thing. We must be a continual learning organization. The era of great power competition will be, will be marred or marked by investments in gray matter as well as gray hulls. To ensure our future competitive strength, I've appointed a new chief learning officer, John Kroger. Please take the time to get to know John Kroger. He is an integral part of this team that is going to affect the foundational basis of how the Navy proceeds as we move forward on the national defense strategy. I've charged him with synchronizing the efforts of our higher learning institutions, exploring new avenues for education and training, and expanding opportunities for our researchers, officers, and civilian teammates. As we learn from not only our internal organizations, and to refresh you all, we have four of the most amazing, the Naval Academy, the Naval Postgraduate School, the Naval War College, and Marine Corps University. That is going to be augmented with the Navy Community College. So we are covering education and career path education from deck plates on up to flag officers. We're going to assess the best practices from both the private sector and academia. We're rolling out our design for an integrated Naval Force structure. I just told you about the visions of both the Commandant and the Marine Corps, but it does not stop there. We're modernizing our naval force, as well as supporting the infrastructure to maximize interoperability and warfighting capability in the joint, with our friends, and with our allies. Our integration efforts also are focusing on our industrial base. We must understand and synchronize our supply chain. It is a team game all the way down to the people making nuts and bolts. It means getting ahead of global trends and ensuring interoperability with our partner nations so we have a lethal overmatch for our warfighters. My sole job wearing the Title X hat is to ensure that none of our men and women in uniform and our civilian teammates that go into harm way go into a fair fight. They will have overmatch. And part of that overmatch, ladies and gentlemen, will be their gray matter. A 355-ship Navy is an important aspirational goal. But more important is sure, ensuring that we have the maximum capability to address every challenge that we're going to be facing. Resources, the services, we must resource the services to support their role in affecting the national defense strategy. 
And I want you all to think about that for a minute because the model of a third, a third, a third might not be the model going forward. These goals will guide the department and its integrated naval services towards a vision that maintains America's sea power to ensure our security and the security of our allies and friends remain in place and the equating prosperity follows. We cannot realize this alone. Meeting our future challenge requires the best thinking available in every section, and I am grateful, Michael, for this meeting here today because I need to call on your minds. I need your ideas. I need your observations to a degree, Um, but your ideas I'd really like. Um, Together, we really have to do this together because we have to outpace what is a very competitive landscape right now for not only the American people but our friends and allies so we can collectively protect all that we hold dear. And in that light, I look forward to uh, this discussion coming up. Thank you very much. Those are great remarks and uh, great framing of the challenge and the progress so far. So I wanted to really, in in the time I have privileged to uh, be up here with you before we go to the audience, uh, focus on two broad areas, if I could. One is current readiness and how the forces are doing today, and then get back to the topic of vision and the future and the great power competition before us, if I could. And so if we could just take a moment, and please feel free to go where you like, but I think my interest would be on the people of, of the Navy and Marine Corps as well as on equipment. We know there have been challenges, especially with the latter in recent years. But of course, uh, it's always a challenge to maintain an all-volunteer force that's been working so hard and a strong economy, always recruiting and retention challenges. We had an event here on Monday with uh, Holly Petraeus and some others, by the way. Who? So this is our second Navy event because it turns out, you may know, she's an honorary chief Navy petty officer, yes, she is. which I hadn't previously appreciated. But we were. the topic was the uh, employment opportunities or lack thereof for many military spouses and how it's still hard on many military families. And as you try to recruit and retain a strong force for both the Navy and Marine Corps. How's it going? We know the Army's had some problems lately meeting targets. Uh, How have you done, and just how do you see the overall human side of the uh, Department of the Navy? Michael, it's a a great question, and let me address it in in a two-prong, one, the people, and then the equipment um, and infrastructure. Uh, People are our most important and valuable asset. They're also our most expensive asset. So we have to frame everything in that regard. If I look at our numbers, both the Navy and the Marine Corps have been recruiting 100% to their goal. Um, But that comment that I made is squarely something that is keeping us awake at night. We can't simply rely on our logo to bring people in the door. And I take a moment when people talk about the all-volunteer force. It is not an all-volunteer force. It is a 100% recruited force. We are out there just like every high school coach, NBA coach, college institution recruiting, pulling people into the organization. There's a very little percentage of people that walk in and say, today I want to join the Navy or the Marine Corps. Um, In that light, we have to put our game on. And let's go to E4S. A very interesting conversation I had up on the Hill when people started actually looking what we're doing in education, both both the community college and uh, education through uh, uh, people's careers. One of the questions was, Mr. Secretary, how are you going to afford this? And especially in light of how the business model of the Marine Corps works. It's a youthful organization that has high turnover intentionally. That's, that's their business plan. And my re- I, I didn't even have to think about the answer. It's everything I've taken from business. I want to treat the employee, i.e. the uniform person, the best I can, give him the best, him or her, the best education they have to contribute to my cause while they're here. If they choose to leave or we ask them to leave, I want to have a smart, happy person on the street contributing to society as an educated person, positively talking about their experience in either the Navy or Marine Corps. I can't buy that kind of advertising. And the converse is true. If I have somebody who's disgruntled, who said, Navy Marine Corps never gave me any education, they never gave me any opportunity, I got out because it was a dead-end street, that negative message will reverberate and, and, and my dollars in advertising get diminished. So there's a purpose for this education. and There's a purpose of focusing on the people. And it goes both to civilian and uniform. We're, we're, we're combining our efforts here. It is a whole team. Because at the end of the day, it is the gray matter that fights the ship. And it's the gray matter that supports the ship. Let's talk about ships. Let's talk about the equipment. 
I hung around the, uh, the Pentagon for 10 years on the Defense Business Board and was lulled into some sort of complacency that I actually understood what was going on. Um, and then all of a sudden took this job and really started uh, looking under the sheets to see what was going on. Ladies and gentlemen, for 18 years we had flown the wings off the plane and sailed the bottoms off the ships and wrung our sailors and Marines out to the nth degree. We are now paying for that. I want to compliment Congress at this point by giving us the budgets they gave us and funding them timely up to this point uh, helped us tremendously to get back on even keel. Many of you have been following the ship's maintenance issues, specifically surface ships and subsurface. Yeah, you know what? This shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. We let this go for way too long. We're still bringing ships in where we open up areas of the ship that haven't been looked at in five to seven years. Of course, there's going to be a laundry list of stuff that has to be done. We're getting up on keel, though, on plane. It's taking long to get the initial set through to set the foundation going forward. New ship build. I made a bet with the president. But what's fascinating, and we can go into that a little later, what's fascinating is America made a bet 20 years ago that they could turn off shipbuilding and turn it on at any time. We are suffering right now due to the fact we made that decision. We do not have the workforce that we need. We're spooling it up right now. The, the, some of the best opportunities for employment right now, I'll tell you, are in the shipbuilding centers. We're looking for people. We'll help train you to come join our organization or, or an affiliate. We are really in a tender, tender position. People ask me what keeps me up at night, and everyone expects me to say, you know, China or Russia. What keeps me up at night, believe it or not, is the supply chain. That is a, cons- a, a, a considerable concern of mine. And we're out there paying attention to it and seeing what we can do to make sure that it is resilient and sustainable. We're going to get there. Uh, we're on a good footing right now. We're going to get there. Um, the Ford, a great example. Um, I listened to uh, Representative Luria yesterday question my head of acquisitions and the head of my maintenance, uh, Admiral Moore. And I look at uh, her and other leadership on the Hill that continually disparage the Ford as a program. And I get a little upset, and then I go, wow, Richard, think of the positive here. You could not ask for leaders in Congress who take disparaging comments against a platform we're developing with new technologies. You could not ask for a better disinformation program for our competitors. And I truly mean that. The way we went to the moon was because the country was behind this to get us to the moon with new technologies. We're going to work this out. The Navy has this worked out. EMALS works. Automatic arresting gear works. Where do we have problems? We have problems with the elevators. Tomorrow, yeah, this morning, we signed elevator number four over. Deep elevators four, five, and six are moving in the ship. They're going to be tested and certified. Everything will be working when she goes IOC. A comment was made yesterday going, I can't believe that this floating birthing barge is not going to be ready until 2024. It will be IOC'd to be sent to the fleet much earlier than that. Then it takes 18 months for the air wing to get certified. Then it goes out on deployment. Bad on Navy for the semantics of what deployable is. The ship will be ready to serve and do what it's going to do in the time that the CNO decides is appropriate. And it'll be sooner than 2024. Um, there is goodness going on. We are, if, if you look at what we've done with the Navy sustainment program for the F-18, when I arrived, and I'm not saying I, it's a team I, but 47% of my Navy F-18s were mission capable. 47%. We got the aviation community together, and I said, if I was a CEO of an airline, I'd be fired and probably sued for malfeasance with 47% availability. We hit 80% the other day. How'd we do it? We looked at our systems, we looked at our command and control, and immediately went, wow, this isn't the most optimum agile way to work. And we moved rice bowls, and we moved cheese. And for any of those of you who have been in the Navy, been in the military, have been observers of it, that's one of the hardest things to do right there, is to change the culture and change the command and control. That was step one. Step two, we looked outside. It it, it is is, uh, kind of an irony that in the 50s and 60s, corporate America looked to the Pentagon for two things, two primary things, risk management, an industrial process. We atrophied there completely. And the private sector went around us, and they're way out in front of us. 
We tasked some mindsets that had managed the maintenance program at Northwest Airlines, Southwest Airlines. Delta jumped on board to help us. And there were brilliant flashes of the obvious that, that we had not incorporated. We did. We moved that forward. And now we're rolling that out throughout the whole Navy. It's called the Navy Sustainment Program. Interestingly enough, maintenance is maintenance. It doesn't matter in the true sense whether it's a ship, an airplane, a tank, whatever the case may be. You have to have parts online. You have to have flow. You have to have touch time. Everybody who was watching the F-18, i.e. surface warfare, subsurface warfare, maintenance, were all in the room. They're rolling those programs out now. So the news is that we're changing dramatically. We think dramatically. From the outside, there's no silver bullet. There's no, nothing sexy and shiny about what we're doing. This is blocking and tackling running a business. And that's how we're moving the needle. By the way, congratulations on that improvement in so many areas of readiness. And just if I could, a quick sort of small plea or editorial comment. I hope some of this becomes more public, more systematically, because really going back to the Rumsfeld period at the Pentagon and through the Obama years and now in the Trump administration, I think DOD has been more reluctant to share readiness data, feeling like it's giving away something to the enemy or what have you. Now that you've restored so many areas of readiness, it might help those of us who want to argue in coming years for a stable defense budget in an era that could see some pressure for cuts, that this is some of the goodness that comes out of decent funding. But that's, I'll leave that for you to contemplate or not as you see fit. I wanted to raise a broader question. Uh, you talked about carriers and, and readiness and deployments. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, at a philosophical level, do you think we can afford to be a little bit less predictable in our deployments anyway? Because certainly Secretary Mattis said we should be strategically predictable, but operationally unpredictable. And there's been a lot of talk about whether the carrier should have gone to the Baltic Sea or the Persian Gulf. Frankly, I don't worry about these things too much because I just assume that things not be on a schedule, that we'd be able to do different things at different times. So does the Navy need to actually go further in, in sort of challenging this notion that you always must be on a certain station with a number of ships, uh, you know, continuously? You just qualified for Assistant Secretary of the Navy Operations. Uh, truly, uh, we are dedicated to that, Dy dynamic force employment. That's exactly what it is. I mean, if you really look back and go, are you kidding me? You used to publish in papers and let everyone know that you were leaving on X date to steam over to A station and stay on A station with a retirement date, a retreat date of X. I mean, that's crazy. Uh, we, not only do we have to get out there with dynamic force employment, we have to mix the game up. I mean, one of the things that we're, we're I, I love it. We were sitting there about uh, nine months ago, and I was looking at uh, LHA, I was looking at America, the USS America, uh, a, a, uh, a terrific amphib ship. Uh, and I said, you know what? Why don't we load this thing up with F-35 Bravos? Put 20 F-35 Bravos on this and make it, quote, unquote, a lightning carrier. Well, ends up the Marine Corps thought about that. You might see us do that in the near future. And you know what? We might just launch it out once, just to you know, try it out, put it in a couple of, uh, of exercises, and know that we have it up our sleeve. If you look at our whole assessment of the spectrum of threat, and, and Admiral Stu Munch has done a terrific job on this, and there's an unclassified version that you might find interesting, but it's to go back to understand where the threat levels are and where the ceilings are and where people are playing and where things go kinetic and off-ramps that you can constantly uh, uh, maneuver with. But one of the most amazing things that we have to go back to, and we did this in the Cold War and we've abandoned it when we were doing all our coin operations, was action, reaction. Try something over here and watch how the reaction goes. Try something over here and watch the reaction. Don't just fly over and drop a bomb on somebody on a bicycle. Uh, while that's effective, we have to be much more strategic. We're moving towards that direction. It's interesting. When Admiral uh, Richardson was here last winter, uh, he talked about the fact that the Navy almost felt pressure to be in the Persian Gulf region on deployment, maybe even more often than he would have preferred because it provided missile defense capability. Are you seeing some potential you know, easing of the pressure on the Navy with some of the additional land-based deployments of missile defense in recent weeks? Is that sort of a better joint approach towards Persian Gulf security that would also continue down this vein of allowing you to really have a dynamic force employment model? Yes, Michael, it is. I mean, if you look at the grand scheme of thing of jointness, it was interesting. So I got out of the Marine Corps in 1981. We were just weaning ourselves off of whale oil back then, I think. But um, uh, I, it, jointness wasn't even in the, in the lexicon. I remember flying my H-46 over Fort Ord, and there was obviously an accident that had happened. 
and, and we were going to obviously try to land and be of assistance. We couldn't even get the same frequencies and communicate with the Army. Now, jointness is really, it, it's gone beyond even saying it. It's just operationally happening. Uh, land-based precision fires help us tremendously because then we're not tethered to a BMD mission. We can actually be what the Navy is, which is to be a maneuverable force to provide consternation to our competitors as to where we are. Yeah, thank you. Um, on the issue of carriers, now if I could shift more towards your vision for the future, and I wanted to hone in specifically on your vision of the aircraft carrier fleet, leaving aside specifics about the Ford class or anything else. And I was recently at a Lexington Institute discussion on the future of the carrier. It was a very good discussion. It was Chatham House rules, so I'll just sort of summarize. But there were several different schools of thought about the future of the survivability and utility of the carrier. And there was one school that said, because we can interfere with an enemy's satellites or communications, and we can move the carrier around, even though it looks like a big vulnerable platform, it's actually pretty survivable. There was another school that said, if we put more longer range platforms on the carrier, uh, we can mitigate whatever vulnerabilities and still have it be pretty survivable. And there was a third school that sort of said, you know, um, I'm not persuaded yet the carrier is going to be survivable in an all-out fight against Russia or China, but there are many other missions that are still important, including sort of what you might call phase two, phase 2.5, the, yep. the, the crisis response, the early levels of hostilities when you might be engaged in skirmishing with Russia or China, but you're trying to prevent all-out war. And that role for the carrier is crucial, even if in an all-out war, many of them might be sunk. I wondered if you come down in any of those camps or how, just how you think about the future of long-range uh, you know, carrier air power and, and how we're going to be able to protect it, utilize it in sort of one to two decades into the future. Yep. No, this has been a, uh, a, a focal point uh, in conversation since arrival in August of, uh, of 17. Um, Michael, I'm actually in all three camps, believe it or not. Um, one, um, if we went into a SAP level, which we can't, uh, I, I'm pretty comfortable that it is defensible in various environments. Uh, two, um, I truly believe uh, that we will have more standoff uh, on two fronts. One, uh, extending the reach of the missiles, that, uh, the weapons that we have at hand, but two, the ability to also tank and fuel. Uh, probably in that order. And three, which everyone keeps forgetting, if in fact, and I, I by the way, all my uh, uh, comments today are facing the Pacific Theater, which is primarily a Navy Air Force theater and Army in, in, in another layer. But we are out there right now, and that is when you look at the national defense strategy, uh, uh, primarily a Navy uh, subsequently Air Force uh, uh, support function there, which is when I talk about resourcing to the strategy, that's the message that I'm saying. Um, after we have conflict, well, first of all, let me back up. I love it when people say the carrier is just a huge floating target. Last I checked, all you have to do at Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa, Japan, is program in the, the, the GPS coordinates once. It doesn't move. That's a big floating target, too. I actually can maneuver 700 miles a day. Uh, that being said, uh, the maneuverability of that city uh, at any one point in the spectrum of conflict has different exposures to risk. But let's talk also about Section 2.0, when all the airstrips have been destroyed and, and threat re reduces, and now you're doing what I think is one of the most integral things that sometimes we don't pay 100% attention to. What are you doing post immediate conflict on the downside. You have to come in and be able to operate. That, again, is another area where the carrier comes in. In my heart of hearts, um, with the last two carrier by, uh, what will the next carrier look like? We're having discussions on that as we speak. Um, and we'll see what happens. I think we actually whiteboard this thing and go, what will it look like out in 10 to 15 years? Is it a floating platform to electrically or energy charge unmanned aircraft? I don't know. Um, I will tell you that we are augmenting the aircraft carrier with our ideas such as this lightning carrier, uh, 20 F-35 Bravos uh, on a, a large deck amphib. Uh, my cost performance there is tremendous. Uh, does it have the same punch? No, it doesn't. But it does have a very interesting sting to it. So I've got two more areas of technology I'd like to get your thoughts on and then open things up to the audience if I could. Thank you very much for those uh, thoughts about the carrier. Uh, one is going to be amphibious shipping and building on the new commandant's vision in his uh, commandant guidance of the summer. 
And then secondly, I want to talk about uh, unmanned systems and just how you see that writ large. So on the amphibious front, it, you know, the, the Navy and the Marine Corps in the last several decades have increasingly gone towards really big ships, of which we have a relatively modest number. And there were efficiencies associated with that, but of course there are also dangers and uh, pitfalls associated with the vulnerability of having a large fraction of your force on a small number of platforms. It sounds like the Commandant wants to change how we think about amphibious shipping and maybe even go towards substantially smaller, even much smaller ships and distribute our Marines across a wide array of platforms. Can we, are, are we going to whiteboard that kind of a question too and maybe even think about amphibious ships that are half as big, a third as big? You know, and, and at what point do the hydrodynamics of building a smaller platform uh, mitigate against that? Do you, are there certain limitations to just how small you can go if you're trying to operate in, you know, um, in rough seas and cross oceans and get people uh, several thousand miles, uh, you know, towards a theater? Are there certain limitations on just how small you can go? So I'd love to give you a spoiler alert, but I, but I won't. Uh, we're in the middle of our force structure assessment. Uh, which we've kicked out a bit, and we've let Congress know that because of this really uh, big muscle movement we're making, which is this integration of the Navy Marine Corps, uh, your, Navy, your integrated naval forces, um, the answer, Michael, is yes, yes, and yes, fundamentally. Uh, what does it exactly look like? You'll see more of that when we release the force structure assessment. And the reason I'm being somewhat guarded is uh, I want to make sure we're ready to talk about it when we are ready to talk about it. But everything you're talking about is being considered. Uh, if you look at the CNO, uh, uh, his discussions about where the Navy goes, um, you're going to hear DMO a lot, Distributed Maritime Operations. And that is exactly what it means, fan out the assets and have the asset sizing so you can fan it out. Uh, again, more, maneuverable, more maneuverability, more shooters, more, more of a, a, a complex conundrum for targeting by our enemies. Uh, that being said, with that comes the Achilles heel of logistical support, uh, and we're working on that also. Marine-specific, yes, the Commandant, look at what the Marine Corps is. It is a, it is a Marine, Marine-oriented, i.e. on the sea oriented quick reaction force integrated with the Navy. Smaller than the Army, so it's deployable, maneuverable, expeditionary, expeditionary. That in itself speaks to a different platform, an augmented platform size, including unmanned, for both logistics and delivery. That's being entertained. So let me go to the unmanned systems, if I could. Uh, first, could you just give us a little bit of a lay of the land of a couple examples of what the Navy's already doing, what it already has out there? in the way of, of unmanned uh, you know, uh, systems that may be involved in tactical reconnaissance or what have you. But then what are some of the bigger ideas that are at least being whiteboarded for where we might be in 10 or 20 years? And I, I really appreciate the willingness to sort of look to the future and just have a visionary conversation. I think it's very helpful. It's going to be integral. Uh, unmanned air, unmanned on sea, and unmanned undersea, all the domains uh, are, going to, are going to be affected by unmanned. It's not a panacea. It, it's not the holy grail, it's augmenting. Um, we have been experimenting, as you all know, with medium and large size undersea vessels. Small undersea vessels have been around for a while, unmanned. Uh, you've seen that we've had a, uh, the Sea Hunter uh, do a complete uh, coal regs uh, uh, transition from Hawaii to San Diego, unmanned. Um, we're making, we're, we're are we, let me put it this way. We're doing some, uh, some very good research and development in unmanned. Are we going as fast as I want us to go? No. Are we going fast in a very thoughtful way? Yes. Just because I want it to go faster doesn't mean it's not thoughtful. I just cannot beat the drum of urgency enough. And I'll put a line in right now, which concerns me. I listened to President Xi's comments in Nepal two Saturdays ago. Yes, okay, he sent me a message. He sent the United States Naval Integrated Forces team a message. Uh, and we are gearing up appropriately to be able to react. Could you embellish on that a little bit for those who might have missed the comment? Well, he said he would let blood and crush bones of those that do not, those that fight the unification of China. And, and you know, that's a message. So we have to look at what's going to happen and where our allies are and be prepared. Um, and I mean it as a preparation level. But this is the urgency. These are the messages that are being sent out in a competitive environment. 
And remember, and and I, I also punctuate this with every comment I make when I talk about us being prepared. The reason that you have the services that you have, the reason you have a Navy Marine Corps integrated team deployed out in the world is to give the State Department one more day to do what they do best so there's no kinetic activity. And we live by that. But we have to be prepared to have the muscle behind that so there is one more day to negotiate. I want to follow up on on China and the Western Pacific for a moment, if I could, uh, by asking you the following. You know, General Dunford was nice enough to do an event with us here in the spring, and I I tried on this stage to give him a little bit of a pat on the back and say, it seems to me, General, like, you know, in the four years you've been chairman, um, even though there aren't that many problems that went away, things feel a little more stable. It was a non-political comment. I wasn't talking Obama versus Trump. I was talking about, you know, what we've done with the European Deterrence Initiative, uh, what the Navy's done with the rebalance and then the 355 ship goal and putting more resources into shipbuilding and the f- freedom of navigation operations in the Western Pacific. And I tried to say, you know, it feels to me like we're at least a little more stable. And General Dunford would have none of my compliment uh, and, and wanted to underscore just how much ongoing vigilance was still needed. And I understand that point as well. Plus, he's a humble guy who didn't want to, uh, you know, take any credit. But my question to you is, how does the Western Pacific feel to you in the last one to two years since you've been secretary. Do you feel that China is continually finding new ways to probe, or do you feel like we're sort of, for the moment, in kind of a steady state where they put pressure on every, you know, freedom of navigation operation we do, but at least there's no big new surprises. There hasn't been an attack on Taiwan. The Senkaku issue is still there, but it hasn't gotten worse. I mean, how do you put the Western Pacific in context these last couple of years? Well, first, I'd be remiss if I wasn't to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Joe Dunford was just one of the most amazing assets this country has ever had. His four years as Joint Chiefs did exactly what Michael was talking about. Uh, He really put some things together, and he was a lot of glue that kept things together. And uh, we look forward to um, uh, Chairman Milley taking over, but uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, Joe Dunford was just a, a fantastic Marine, a great American, and, and we thank him for the four years that he really, he really got after it. And it doesn't surprise me that he took no credit for it. That's Joe Dunford. Right. The Pacific. <clears throat> um, I think I'm actually more concerned about the Pacific now than when I arrived. But there's a reason. I think I know more now than mm-hmm. when I arrived. Um, my whole statement when it comes to China is... If they would like to acknowledge a rules-based order, uh, there's a place for them at the international table. Um, But if we keep seeing intellectual property theft, bullying of our allies and things like that, um, it's going to be a constant area of tension. Um, You know, one strategy you've you've heard is we have the level of kinetics and that, you know, Russia and China will just stay constantly beneath the level of of kinetics. we're adopting and adapting and innovating to that. Um, it doesn't seem to be subsiding in the Pacific. Um, what's fascinating, which I think is interesting um, for uh, the U.S., is we have a competitor now that has no differentiation between military and civilian. It is an all-of-government approach. We now have been joint inside the Department of Defense. We now have to be joint all-of-government. DOD has to be joint with commerce. DOD has to be joint with treasury. DOD has to be joint with all of government. Thank you. Uh, My last topic uh, is now on the budget, and I just wanted to touch on that. We have one? Exactly, (laughs) or lack thereof, I should have said. Um, And I should also bring up the nationals at some point, but uh, but, (laughs) maybe we'll let somebody else in the crowd do that. We'll have some additional happy news uh, to, to dwell on. But I wanted to ask two questions about the budget. And one of them is you're doing all these exciting things with the Navy. We see DOD with a lot of exciting plans across the board. But we've heard a number of people, including General Dunford and also the uh, Independent Commission on Defense uh, last year, say that to sustain these kinds of plans is going to take 3 to 5% real growth. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on whether you care more about that or you care more about the, the country's fiscal situation, there don't seem to be too many political leaders in either party who really endorse that, that vision. 
including uh, your own administration. And by the way, I'm sort of a cheap hawk, so I don't necessarily sign up with the 3 to 5% real growth to put my own cards on the table. But more, more importantly, from your point of view, as you try to pursue these visions, but you see the administration's own future year's defense plan be essentially flat, uh, how do you reconcile those? Uh, is, there a, is something going to have to give in the vision, or should we not take the fit up too seriously and think that perhaps a reelected President Trump would rethink his defense plans? I mean, how do we view uh, where this sort of rubber meets the road uh, with the services trying to get more innovative and get more ready and thinking they might need 3 to 5 percent real growth, but likely to get 0 percent real growth after the 2021 budget? Terrific observation and question, and um, th- there's many ways to answer it. One, I'm a pragmatist um, and a capitalist, and uh, you have to resource a strategy to make it work. Right out of the bat, I cannot resource this year's plan with last year's budget. Uh, it's problematic. CRs are absolutely insane. Uh, you often hear me refer to Congress as being my board of directors. If this was in the corporate world, they would all be removed by the shareholders and sued for malfeasance. Their job, their primary job, according to the Constitution, is to fund this government. And it's completely irresponsible to not fund this government. Uh, That being said, where are we going? Uh, I want to back up and always kind of rely on a story that my staff will roll their eyes because they've heard it a hundred times a couple of centuries ago. The British have uh, tangled with the French on the high seas. They've... uh, uh, the war is over. They've lost seven frigates. The first sea lord turns to his finance admiral and says, go over to the exchequer and get me a check. We must rebuild seven frigates. The next day, they're having their staff meeting, and first sea lord says, finance, what say ye? And he said, spoke to the exchequer. Exchequer said, we're out of money. We have to start thinking. That's where we are, folks. We're not out of money. But I don't think we're going to see a 3 to 5% growth either. Um, if, in fact, uh, we see uh, a second administration, I think you're going to see, uh, and this is just Richard Spencer talking, you're going to see the government, the, the administration focus on the debt, uh, and you're going to see, I think, some belt tightening. And I am a believer that's a brightly so. Um, we do a great job over the Department of Defense, and I can defend a lot of the things that we do. Can we do them better, faster, quicker, more efficiently? Yes, we can. Um, so we will continue to innovate. We will continue to move forward, but we need to start thinking differently and acting differently. Here's a fine example. And I don't mean to carry on, Michael, this but this good. is really... Um, people came up to and said, are you out of your mind, Secretary, not refueling the Truman? One, that's heresy, but two, that's just insane. It has 25 years left on its life. Okay, folks, let's go back and look at commerce in general. And I had to reach out to get a couple of examples in the private sector. Abandoning an asset is a tough thing to do. But if you look at fleets, whether aviation, trucking, taxi, whatever the case may be, industry moves on about a 15% efficiency. So if you can develop an airplane that's more than 15% more fuel efficient or carry more people, the industry will move to that platform. The beauty industry has is there's a secondary market and they can sell the assets that they have so they can recoup some of their investment. I can't with an aircraft carrier. So I went out to some industries. Well, the petroleum industry, it ends up in speaking to um, a former member of the administration. Uh, they built a refinery where they had to abandon a $2 billion refinery, but it was you know, uh, 26% more efficient. I look at the Ford, which with emals, I get 30% more sortie generation, 25% fewer people on board, and a maintenance cycle that will be improved compared to the Nimitz. It is an efficiency game changer. So let me abandon an older vessel and move to the newer fleet. What does that allow me to do? Free up $3.8 billion in the ship alone and $1 billion a year in the carrier air wing if, in fact, I also downsize that. But let's say I keep the carrier air wing for doing things such as the lightning uh, uh, carrier idea. But $3.8 billion. I can move that to modernization, directed energy, AI, machine learning, uh, uh, additive manufacturing, the things that I must do, quantum computing. I have a, I have a confined budget. I get it. But you've got to give me the latitude to move to innovate. And on that budget, my last question, and this is just a chance to give you uh, a softball 
to which I'm sure you'll hit out of the no park. No such thing as like, softball. Well, right, exactly. But but but, but uh, this is something that the Navy and Marine Corps fellows we've had here, and thank you for them. They're spectacular assets for Brookings, and we're we benefit from them enormously. And in the last couple of years, they've helped me understand the way in which continuing resolutions hurt the Navy. Yeah. Because it, a lot of us think intuitively, well, it prevents you from moving towards your next new acquisition program because that's not in last year's pl plan or wasn't ready to go into procurement or what have you. But even on the maintenance side of things, um, it prevents you from entering into longer-term contracts which give you efficiencies. Can you just say a word about that if you wish? As we try to remind, because everybody hates, this is not a partisan statement, everybody hates continuing resolutions and budgetary uncertainty. Uh, and yet it happens again and again. So I wondered if you could dramatize for us sure. one of the uh, consequences. Well, you know, one of the biggest problems uh, on an opening statement with continuing resolutions is that you have some of the most innovative, creative people over the Department of Defense, and when you throw them a challenge, they respond. And unfortunately, I truly believe that the Hill now believes that the DOD can handle CRs with absolutely no problem at all. One of the problems is we actually do adapt. But we did a study la uh, two years ago in 17, what nine CRs cost the United States Navy in cash. Not the soft stuff, not the fact that we weren't going to do a maintenance program at a shipyard and they let 400 people go who were talented seven-year-plus journeymen who got out of the industry and I can't entice them back into the industry due to uncertainty that's being proven out today with the CR today. That cost in dollars was $4 billion, $4 billion. So when I get accused of a cost overrun on the Ford by my board of directors, and they go and burn $4 billion, I'm confused as to who is responsible for wasting or diddling with, with, with resources. It is an atrocity that a CR exists. It's an atrocity, I think, that they go home on a vacation or a recess, excuse me, and don't do the business that has to be done at hand. We're still working here. Our uniform members and civilian teammates are still out standing the watch. Why can't they? Well, thank you. I've been fortunate to have this conversation with you, and now I want to share the pleasure and privilege. So let's, let's uh, start in the back, please. Wait for the microphone, if you could, and then please introduce yourself before asking your question. Hi, Alex Sanchez, James Defense. Mr. Secretary, I was wondering if you can talk about great power competition in the Western Hemisphere. Admiral Craig Fowler, commander of Southcom, has said repeatedly that extra hemispheric powers like Russia, China, Iran have a growing presence in Latin American and Caribbean waters, like Russian warships or Chinese controlling, uh, Chinese companies controlling Latin American ports. Where does the, where does Southcom fit in the, in the U.S. Navy's future strategy, given the fact that SACOM is tradition you seen as the lowest priority command. Thank you. So that, uh, when we talk about uh, the Pacific theater, that, that's a really good point because there's a footnote. Uh, it is, it, the concern is in every single theater. Uh, Admiral Fowler does a great job of articulating uh, where the threats are coming in from all the competitors that we have into his theater. Uh, and this is why, to be very frank with you, I continually underscore that this is an all-of-government issue that we must do. This is why we must be tied in with ag, must be tied in with commerce, must be tied in with treasury, because it's not just gray hulls and, and silver aircraft uh, to combat this. Uh, and if you look at the strategy we talked about, which is to keep it all below a kinetic level, we must have all-of-government in, and it is in every single theater the threat exists. So go up here to the, uh, to the front row. Go to this gentleman here on the far side, please. Thank you, Secretary. Rob Colarina, AIC Investment. We actually have some interest in ship repair in the U.S. Um, my question is, uh, is, is towards Europe, actually. Um, how are you all viewing Brexit, and can you speak a little bit with NATO uh, as to, um, as to uh, thinking there? So uh, w when it comes to Europe, if we look at the balance of the national defense strategy, I am going to give the preface that 60% uh, uh, of my attention, 65% of my attention is westward looking over to the Pacific. But that being said, uh, the care and feeding uh, uh, and attention to our NATO allies is, is key. Uh, what we've seen, uh, and it started with Secretary Mattis, and, and I, w when he asked me to, 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 to 
put my hand up for this job, and we were talking about his principles. Uh, I, I fully bought into his three primary lines of effort, but the number two line of effort I truly believed in, which is a robust constellation of friends and allies. Because, as you know, he's a historian, and you don't even have to be a historian, but those countries that did not have that robust constellation usually find themselves in the dustbin of history. Um, so from day one, we've been out there. Um, you look at existing allies in the Pacific, and you look at the developing relationships with India, Vietnam. Uh, you look at, uh, on the other side of Europe, to ask, answer your question directly, uh, Norway. Uh, one of our, you know, when it comes to the Navy, one of our strongest allies. Um, we've had discussions, you know, the 2% number, I still stand by the 2% number, that, that everyone should be responsible for the protection of their own country. Um, but uh, I also believe that uh, in countries rally above 2% with soft dollar activities they do in the contribution of global security. By the way, let me follow up if I could. Do you, do you see any day-to-day -day implications or, you know, obstacles or consequences of Brexit in terms of the U.S.-U.K. military-to-military relations? I have not seen that yet. I mean, if you look at one of the strongest relationships of mill-to-mill, -mill, it, it's Britain and uh, it's the U.K. and the U.S. Uh, in 2021, you'll see a Marine Corps uh, F-35 Bravo squadron on the Queen Elizabeth, which we're very excited about. You look at the intertwined activities that we do uh, under sea, it's, it's, it's very strong. Uh, we're not seeing any signals right now that should change our thought that uh, the U.K. will be right beside us, ever in lockstep. Stay here in the front row, my friend John, right here in the aisle. Or I'm sorry, yeah. Sir, George Nicholson, the Washington Liaison from the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. I was at a session last week with Chief uh, of the RAF uh, Air Force uh, Winston, and I asked the question about the Falklands and what happened, what a disaster. And you remember how rapidly after that, for an AEW capability, they developed the radar that they put on their Sea King helicopter. And I said, now with the Queen Elizabeth coming on online and then the Prince of Wales coming online, what are you looking at a future capability? Are you looking at something like a V-22 operating at a higher altitude? And he says, no, what we're looking at is, he says, I've been talking to the First Lord. I guess he's here this week. Yes. He says, looking at an RPV-type capability. Getting back to what you talked about, the enabling capability of the Marines using an ARG as a small carrier, what are you looking at the future of providing that kind of AEW capability uh, for the, the ARGs out there? Hey, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I mean, if you have the RQ-25 refueling, and this discussion was had during its original playoff, was why don't you have one you can hang sensors from? Anything that flies can have sensors. Anything that moves can have sensors. Sensors find the shooters, we kill the shooters. Uh, it's a kill chain analysis. We're going to be looking at absolutely everything we can hang sensors on. Um, and I just want to correct one statement you made when you talked about a Marine Corps ARG. It's not. It's a Naval Services ARG. And I mean that sincerely in that, in that um, it's going to be a naval services integrated application of that resource. So when the combatant commander sits out there and goes, I must have an aircraft carrier, what we want to do is develop the capability and capacity to say, here is a hybrid collection that will, that will have a punch equal to, but not look like. Work a little bit in the back of the room, the uh, gentleman in the lighter blue shirt right there. By the way, is this microphone working, the microphone that people are using in the audience? Can you hear in the back usually? Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, my name is Arthur Ackerman. I'm a student across the street at SICE. And I wanted to ask about, um, well, you mentioned in your remarks uh, several things about integration and jointness and mentioned uh, our allies in the Pacific as well. I was wondering if you could characterize what you think the current state of uh, naval maritime uh, integration with our allies is and what you think the potential future could hold? One, uh, keep doing what you're doing over at Zeiss, then come join us in the government, please. And I mean that sincerely. Uh, we need great minds to help us uh, and assist us. Um, I'm a bull on, on where we've been and where we are now when it comes to the Pacific and interoperability. Um, if you look at RIMPAC last year, we had a Chilean uh, heading up the, uh, the maritime ops. Um, and, and the reason I bring that up is Chile d d thinks of themselves as a Pacific partner. 
And I think in the U.S. mindset, that would be a bit of a stretch. No, that's exactly what we're talking about. We're encompassing all in the Pacific. Uh, I look at, Nor- I look at uh, New Zealand. I look at Australia. I look at what we're doing with P8s over there, along with surface integration. It's integral. Uh, I look at what we're doing um, you know, with South Korea, our traditional uh, maneuvers with Japan. Uh, I look at what we're doing with Vietnam, which is just the tip of the iceberg, and there's a lot to go there. But who would have took an interview in the White House for this job? Um, I was said, can you get an aircraft carrier into Cameron Bay? That is your goal in 17. I swallowed hard and said, okay, I, we can give it a shot. We'd had, we didn't get it into Cameron Bay. We got the carrier into Da Nang. Uh, who would have thought that 10 years ago, five years ago? Um, so there are relationships that are nascent to, to well-cooked that we're all trying to weave together, and we're doing it. We're having interoperability exercises that don't just mean, hey, um, uh, Indonesia, fall in on, on, on the U.S. carrier flag, dash 17 in the back of the trail. No, it's you're going to be actually doing something in this exercise, uh, again, to flex the muscle, as we call it, sets and reps. That's how we're going to get good at what we do. And interoperability is the poster child for sets and reps for interoperability. Just a corollary off of that, I'm going to take one more prerogative to follow up. Uh, How would you describe at a Navy level the current operational workings of the U.S.-Filipino alliance, which we know it's still there on paper. It's still there in some meaningful sense. We got special forces helping them with internal issues. But President Duterte, whatever one thinks of his domestic policies, he's got this need to navigate the China relationship and the U.S. relationship. And, you know, I I understand his predicament at some level, even if I don't sympathize with everything he does tactically. Uh, How would you describe the current state of that alliance from a Navy point of view? I know what I'm about to say is is a brilliant flash of the obvious for many of you who are either in the services or watch the services. But one of the most amazing things that came readily apparent to me being Secretary of the Navy, and I was aware of it but didn't really see it in action, is the mill-to-mill relationship that exists globally with all our services. Regardless of where the politics are in the various countries, we still have very strong military-to-military relationships in various cases. The Philippines is, again, a poster child for that. The military-to-military relationship is very, very strong. We'll see what happens you know, with, with the politics, but the foundation is there. Uh, Thailand, another, where um, the Marine Corps relationship uh, with Thailand historically is tremendous. Um, the, our government decided to not recognize them during the coup, uh, we still kept talking to them and, uh, you know, keeping the communications up. To, so when, in fact, the light turned green, uh, we were ready to uh, get back to business. Thank you. Uh, we'll say in the middle section again, this gentleman on the, on the aisle, about six rows back. Yep. Thanks. Hi, Christopher Woody from Business Insider. Uh, I wanted to ask about the Navy's plans for the Arctic, uh, specifically, you know, do you have any plans for permanent basing up there? And in what role do you see unmanned systems playing in your operations in that region? The Arctic is a, uh, is a key zone. I think you've heard me speak about that before. And it was interesting because I'll be very honest with you. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's the old line I could barely spell Arctic before I came on board, and now I'm living it. Um, in one of the first uh, meetings I had as Secretary of the Navy was the Arctic Conference up in Reykjavik and really got exposed to what's going on up there, what the traditional foundational base of our understanding of the Arctic has been and where we're going. Um, it was great working with uh, uh, the former CNO, Admiral Richardson, when I was showing my frustration that we needed to get up there, and he kept reminding me, sir, we've been up there since 1969, under the ice. And I said, well, okay, that's, that's fascinating, but peace through presence is a little difficult with the submarine. Um, uh, we are going to be up there. We're operating, as you know. We did Trident Juncture. Uh, we went north of the Arctic Circle, first time since 1996. We had a carrier strike group and, and amphib ships north of the Arctic Circle. What did we learn? Boy, uh, talk about Mike Tyson's great line, a plan is great until you get punched in the nose. Um, we learned a lot uh, that where we had to uh, shore up our learning and where we had to shore up uh, our sets and reps. Gunston Hall uh, hit some heavy weather, tore the hell out of the well deck. What we learned down there, I'll write a check for that kind of damage any single time when I saw what we learned from going up there. 
Um, we will be in the Arctic Circle, above the Arctic Circle, in the high North Atlantic, in the high Pacific, in the Bering Straits on a regular basis. Will we have permanent basing up there? I don't know. Would I like to see a logistics center up there, something like a Nome? Yeah, that would be great, where we could have a, all of government, so the Coast Guard's up there, the Navy's up there, uh, NOAA's up there, whatever. Uh, it, is, it, it is a strategic integral area that we have to pay attention to. Um, and the mission up there is to, you know, keep order in place and make sure that everyone, uh, uh, you know, and this is collectively all Arctic countries, and this is what we signed up to on the compact, was to keep order and, and, and focus uh, on, on the attributes of the Arctic. Up there, do you see Russia as a competitor or a partner or both? Uh, I, would, uh, I would love to say both. Um, we see what they're doing up there. Uh, I mean, I have to admit, day one when I was at the conference and uh, the Russian ambassador to the Arctic, said, when I asked him, why are you repaving five Cold War airstrips and why are there 10, reportedly 10,000 Spesnav troops up there, he said, search and rescue, Mr. Secretary. Um, I, and now I see their plans for the North Passage which um, is a taxation under the concept of you must pay for search and rescue. We can argue either side of that. But is it a controlling fact for free flow of commerce? I worry about their position there. Uh, that being said, dialogue must remain open. We have to keep those avenues of communication open with receding ice. You've seen the arguments compared to the Suez Canal, the time and dollar savings by going over north. That's happened. It's going to, it's going to continue to happen. We have to be present. So we'll come here to the th third row, please. And then we'll back again. Hi, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for coming. My name is Jackson Richmond. I'm with Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Amid the tension between the U.S. and Iran, including in the Gulf, what would constitute as an act of war for the U.S. Navy? Is the U.S. Navy capable of defending itself against Iran? Well, that's a wide open question. One, the act of war is the role of Congress. So the Navy has no role in that. Uh, but two, uh, depending upon what levels you're talking about, I believe we're completely defensible in where we stand right now with the environment that we're faced. So we'll go to the gentleman in the white shirt, green jacket, and then the, right after that will be the woman right behind him. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you were right. Uh, thank you. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Suzuki uh, from Japan Ground Defense Force, and I work as an exchange officer. Uh, I'm a headquarter at the Pentagon now. So I'm very honored to be here to listen to your talk to this morning. And then I'm very surprised that you put the, your focus on uh, uh, the human matters, the best uh, important things, because um, uh, General McConville, uh, the CSA, is also the focus. His priorities yes. are the people, the army, family. So my question is related to the, uh, um, the interoperability things, because I'm the staff officer. So uh, how, do you have any um, the idea, the future perspective of the relationship between uh, uh, Navy and Army, so as a joint force, um, so because a joint uh, effort will be very important. So you, maybe, sir, uh, you focus on uh, uh, alliance partners, but I really want to know the, your thought about the future relationship between uh, uh, Navy and Army. Thank you. A, a, a great example. Uh, one, a totally all in on a complete triad integration or quad when we include also our Coast Guard brothers and sisters because they're alongside us every single day in the fight. Um, uh, F-35, uh, uh, Navy or Marine Corps F-35 uh, uh, targets um, uh, a position, uh, radios down to uh, Air Force Command and Control Targeting Center, data sent to an Army Long Range Precision Fires Battery, eliminates target. That is what I would consider the example of how we are integrated. We are there now. Now we have to do sets and reps. Um, when it comes to the Pacific, do I want Army... Uh, long-range precision weapons, <laughs> damn straight I do. Uh, they're integral to, to, to what would have to do uh, in the Pacific if something had to happen. The Army and the Air Force use the expression multi-domain operations <laughs> sometimes to talk about this. Do you folks use that as much? Or you just use, should, are you guys all in with that? Or is it you just use different words to explain no, the same thing? it's really funny. We were at, I believe, CSIS, Heather Wilson, Mark Esper, and myself for our first three service secretary presentation. 
And, and uh, Mark and Heather kept asking me, what is your, before we were going on the stage, what is your um, uh, uh, position on multi-domain? I said, well, the United States Navy has been in multi-domain since 1942. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, we are totally in. <laughs> right, right. Thank you. Oh, the one right, before, right behind, yes, and the red scarf. Hi, sir. Good morning. My name is Katrina Lego, and my question is, what are your thoughts on the future of the Navy and Marine Corps integration potentially with a future Space Force or Space Command? I didn't catch the end. I'm sorry. Uh, what are your thoughts on the potential integration of a Navy and Marine Corps force with the Space Force or Space Command? Uh, okay. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question because we're now really um, um, grinding it through our teeth and digesting it. My fundamental position, and I believe the CNO and the Commandant uh, agree with me, is uh, we've moved to um, a thought process where uh, I just want the service and or the resource provided to me. Do I think Navy should go to space and put its own satellites up there? We did that with MUOS. Um, but I also just signed a memorandum of agreement with the Air Force that they'll, they'll take over MUOS next generation. Uh, that's their, if that's your expertise, uh, I want you to run it, and I'll just buy the service from you. That's in crude, that's in capitalist sense right there. In DOD speak, I need your jointness integrated. So we now have a space command. Do you expect that we will have a space force within a year or two, or is that just still open-ended and un- unclear? I think we'll have a space force. It's, but the current state of the defense authorization bill wouldn't quite get us to the finish Correct. line. I thought you said, would we? Right. Eventually. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so let's stay in the back, and then we'll come back to the front for one last salvo. So uh, the gentleman right there, yes. Please. Uh, thank you for your insightful speech today. Uh, this is Zhang Ho Lee from South China Morning Post. I was just wondering, what role do you expect the Asian middle power countries to play in the South China Sea? And also, I was just wondering, is there a particular country that should do more to, to protect the rule of law? Uh, great question. Let me ask you to define middle power countries. Uh, as an example, um, South Korea or um, Japan, if you can classify Japan as a middle power, or other uh, ASEAN countries. Okay. I would call those lead, lead countries over there. Uh, integral part. Um, we are all in this together. And what I mean by that, I'll, go, I'll, I'll relay to you an interesting story that happened uh, uh, October of 17, I had the complete uh, Vietnamese uh, military delegation out for a dinner on uh, a little asset I have, which we call the, uh, the, 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 the Secnav's Barge, which is a nice little boat we go out and have dinner on on the Potomac. And with the appropriate amount of translators were there for both sides. And I started to explain, because I was asked, what is the U.S.'s position on allied and friends supporting relationship? And uh, we had been, I'd been speaking to Secretary Mattis about this in depth as I talked earlier, but even as we were moving out to make sure we were in line on a unified message. And that message was, we have to do this together. We have to do this lockstep side by side. The U.S. is not going to land there with big boots, big ships, and big guns and go follow me. You're the expert in your area. You have the complete expertise in your area. We need that. We're going to be side by side, at which point the translator got involved with the Minister of Defense in a quite animated conversation. And it lasted literally about a minute and a half. And the translator turned around and said, "Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Secretary, the minister doesn't understand what you're saying. Do you really mean to say that you're going to be side by side versus landing in front and saying, follow me? And I said, that is exactly what I'm saying. The whole mood of the meeting changed and we started speaking English. It was fascinating. Uh, one more in the middle before we come to the front. So let's see uh, the gentleman in the uh, yellow and blue tie, please. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. My name is Ari Brown. Um, so Admiral Rickover, when he was first uh, building the nuclear power program, ran into an issue with the control rods, and he found that he was getting price gouged by the one company that was making them, given that he was the one customer. Uh, earlier, you talked about how running the Navy is a lot like running a business. How do you plan to hold businesses accountable uh, to prevent future price gouging? Uh, I look at it a different way. Um, one, we, we have to make sure that we have a resilient enough supply base so that opportunity cannot present itself. That being said, 
there are certain areas where the supply base is not that resilient. We have to come to this uh, uh, level of interoperability between our industrial base and the Department of Defense that I call a partnership. And a partnership is equal uh, uh, risk-based, equal reward, equal risk. So the U.S. government, there are exceptions to this, can't take 90% of the risk. I need to work with a risk return. We'll take 90% of the risk if you're willing to take 1% of the return. But I, I would find that hard to work in the, in, in, in the capital marketplace. We started this discussion in 17. Um, uh, what's the grade I'd give myself? I'd give myself a C. I'd give industry a C, C+. Plus. Um, some get it, some don't. That being said, there are areas where I do only have one supplier, and that is problematic in some cases. You have to spend more attention there. But it's not just price, price gouging. It's paying attention. So if, in fact, the rod builder is saying, I'm the only one who can do this, I need to focus down into their supply chain. I can't just sit there and say, you're gouging my eyeballs out. I have to get into their supply chain to say, why are you pricing it like this? Sometimes we find out that price gouging is in our mind. That is actually the market price. Now, we can go into the argument that says a monopolist set the market price. I, I don't want to get What I'm saying is we have to start paying attention. One of the things that I've made a point, I spent two months recruiting Hondo Gertz as, as acquisition head for the Navy. The reason being is he has an amazing track record for not just working the system and understanding how to maximize the system, he has an amazing ability to create acolytes that understand that also and disperse them out into the system so we're going to get leverageability going forward. But he also subscribes to the same vision I have, which is we have to be the smartest client out there, the smartest buyer out there. We can't simply sign a contract and go, the price is X, we're all done. The price is X, and now i got to pay attention to every single supplier in there because there might be a supplier, as I just said, who is making an integral part. But if I invest $25 million with that client by giving them a digital tool, my, his, their performance increases fourfold. Why wouldn't I make that return on investment decision and say, I will give you $25 million to get a digital tool if it produces that much of a return for me? This is an interesting conversation to have on the Hill because it's not quite widely understood, to be very frank with you. But this is the kind of interaction we have to be, being an intelligent client. You have to work your whole supply chain. We did not pay attention to our supply chain for decades, and we are in a very precarious situation due to that. So we've got time for one or two more, and then we'll have to wrap up. Uh, These are okay, great yeah, questions. Yeah, they are good, aren't they? Uh, gentleman in the red tie in the fourth row, please. And any day out of the Pentagon is a great day, so I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary. Uh, my name is Robert Kimenares. Uh, with the issues that you've described with dealing with funding from Congress um, and getting funding from Congress, uh, do you see the, <laughs> the Navy's efforts and DOD as a whole, I guess, uh, to fund long-term projects like AI, quantum computing, computing and even nuclear modernization well-received? Um, and if not, how do you insist on proactive planning instead of reactive? Um, I'm a firm believer in accountability. I'd give myself a D, that's the letter D, as a grade for educating my board of directors for the importance of these future weapons. And the reason I'm giving myself a D is the non-refueling of the Truman as an example. No one got it that we needed $3.8 billion to go to. It wasn't that important for them to understand the argument. So whether they thought they could fund it themselves with different dollars, which we don't have, it's a fail. Uh, we've regeared. We're on the hill. We're talking about how we desperately need these. I mean, if you look at probably my longest-term project I have right now that's in reality, it's Columbia class. It's the number one acquisition program for the United States Navy. We're going to do something we have never done. We're going to be building a submarine and developing a new submarine and building it simultaneously. Virginia class, which was our last new build back in the early, late 80s, early 90s, um, I will put up there as probably one of the best acquisition programs I know in the Navy, and it might be in the whole Department of Defense. Um, but now we're adding on a complexity to that that is stunning, to say the least. Um, 
I need all the things that you just mentioned as weapons to build that system. I need AI to build that system, predictive analytics, design analytics. I, I need quantum computing. Uh, I, I need absolute, uh, additive manufacturing. I need all of this for that system. Um, all I can do is keep trying to educate uh, because it is absolutely critical. We keep looking at the battle that's right here five feet in front of us, and, and, and we can't ignore that. Don't get me wrong. We've got to get DDGs out of maintenance on time. Um, we, gotta get, uh, we, we, we have to fight for two- and three-year OMEN money to do maintenance. Uh, we have a pilot program. Thank God the, 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 the Senate Armed Service Committee and the, the, the Senate Appropriations Committee is putting up a pilot for that this year. The fact of doing one year of maintenance is absolutely, fund one year maintenance is insane. But I get the appropriator's point of view. One of our whole goals is control of money. So we have to work our way through this. It's a dynamic that's unique. I totally get it. But in, I, I would like you to find a corporation that has a capital installed base I have that only funds one year maintenance at a time. The signal it sends out to your suppliers is, why am I going to gear up? Why am I going to get better? Why am I going to make any investment in my system if I don't know from year to year what I have coming my way? Gentleman here in the uh, red tie in the third row, please. And then we'll take one more after that, if that's good. Like I said, keep them coming. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Um, just a follow-up question to the last one you, you discussed uh, regarding uh, the broader duties, tech priorities, AI, machine learning, nano, et cetera. Um, given the Navy's vast research enterprise, NRL, ONR, which areas would you say the Navy is pretty strong in right now, and which areas do we need to focus for the future? So the whole research area in the Navy um, uh, is an area that we've been looking at. Uh, you've, heard, uh, you've heard Secretary Esper when he was in the Army, the uh, night court. Uh, Navy's been doing this for years. It's called zero-based budgeting. Uh, sing for your dinner, uh, for your program. Um, uh, ONR, in general, all of research in the Navy has been a tremendous asset. As we get to these constrained resource environments, um, we're going to have to have everyone singing for their dinner to make sure that the dollars we're putting out there are correct. Should we be investing in AI development inside the Navy, or should we be looking at what's going outside in the commercial sector? If I have one dollar that I can spend, where do I put that? These are the kind of discussions that we're going to have to have. Should we be working on, on fuel efficiencies uh, uh, when, in fact, you have a whole capital markets out there, uh, capital market-driven organizations in the energy field working on fuel efficiencies? We have to rationalize this. So rather than call out anything that we're specifically good at across the board, it's a continuum process. And the discussion now is if we're in true partnership, which I truly hope we are, because I think people are saying they want to be in this partnership, what can other people do better than we can do? Okay, so we'll take two more before we wrap, and we'll go here uh, in the second row, and then the woman in the third row. Oh, and you also? So, so we'll see if we can, you want to do three more? Right here in the Three way. more. Great. Uh, Peter Humphrey, intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Uh, about this conquest of the seas uh, south of China, uh, phone-ups, is that all we got? Uh, is there anything else? To do what? And, and equally important, do we have standing rules of engagement uh, in case something comes our way? Or do commanders have to call up the National Command Authority and wait two days to get a response and then do something? I have to ask, though, uh, FONOPS, is that all we have in order to do what? Constrain the conquest of an area three times the size of Australia. Constraining, totally different. No, FONOPS is simply keeping avenues of, of, of independent, open channels of, of commerce open. Um, that's why I ask, because it's two different answers. That's what FONOPS is about, uh, making sure that the, 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 the maritime channels, uh, that the, the independent maritime channels are open and we ply them at all times. Constraint is a whole different that's a whole different argument. Um, whether it's a 355 ship Navy in capability or in capacity, um, how we weight that over there, uh, it's a whole different uh, uh, metric, to be very frank with you. And I leave that to everyone's understanding and knowledge uh, because I really don't want to go into the actual digits on how that can be done and will be done. But you should, the, FONOPS and containment are two different, two different situations. As far as rules of engagement, yes, there are standing rules of engagement. At, at the ship level. And a U.S.-China uh, agreement dating back to about 2014, right? Correct. Yeah. 
Uh, here in the third row, please. Yeah, hi, uh, Secretary. Um, for cyber, cyber security, we heard <coughs> like the Apple Safari browser connected with Tengxun. Tengxun is a Chinese company which have been spawn feeding customer information to Chinese police system. And also we from f the Freedom House research, uh, Huawei export the their facility to more than 70 countries, also including South Korea and Brazil. So in your view, how to avoid those insecure things happen relevant with Navy? Thank you. The whole, uh, there's two levels of answer here. One is the tactical level of, of, of cyber and cyber prophylactic for the Navy. Uh, I think for those of you who do follow Navy, you know that uh, we set up a review after we had three exfiltrations of, of meaningful data. And when I say meaningful, it's kind of ironic because the statements are they were non-confidential data. Um, but one thing that everyone should remember is you can get three pots of non-confidential data, you combine them, and all of a sudden it becomes confidential information. That being said, it, 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 I was tremendously concerned. So we put together a standing committee of people who have gone through cathartic cyber events uh, ranging from Raytheon to Citibank uh, on the corporate side to inside government, NSA, FBI. Uh, and we had a board that was stood up, and it's on my, my website, I believe, the, the, the study and the recommendations. It's critical that, um, that we now march out, which is why I've stood up. Uh, I actually asked for an assistant secretary of cyber, and uh, Congress said uh, no we'll give you a special assistant. Well, the special assistant works directly for me and has my ages. And he's out of the cyber world from the private sector. Uh, he's marching underway. Um, we are woefully behind. Uh, again, I'm going to be f very candid and transparent. Um, we have plans in place to, uh, to rectify the situation. Um, but my conversations on the Hill... Uh, where last year they might have been and we're out there to deliver the fight tonight, is that I need every single resource I can, and that's not dollars are, are, are the least of it, to be very frank with you, it's gray matter, uh, every single resource I can to combat this because I need to fight to get off the pier. I might not be able to start the ship. I might not be able to get fuel to the ship. Uh, if you look at Sun Tzu, what is one of, the, one, of the, one of his rules? Take over the enemy and keep all their assets intact. That is Cyber 101. Um, on a greater scenario, to be very frank with you, I uh, just wrote an op-ed on um, what are we doing taking uniformed and my civilian teammates' retirement dollars and investing them in companies that provide a direct threat right back to us. And I'm specifically calling out Russia and China companies. We're funding AVIC that makes the DF-21 and the DF-26, the stated carrier killer. And unwittingly, I have to believe my uniformed service members are being invested in that company. This is insanity, total insanity. We have Russian companies that are blocked from doing business here, accessing our capital markets. I mean, we have to, this, this is game on time. We've got to wake up and realize this is all of government that has to pay attention. That's a great question. And the last question here in the second row. Hi, uh, Caitlin Kenny with Stars and Stripes. You said earlier that um, Representative Luria yesterday, her comments were disparaging about the USS Ford. She was kind of talking about how it's been like six years behind schedule for delivery, and like last year was supposed to be the deployment, its deployment schedule. Do you feel that her comments were unfair or untrue in any way, or because she said that whether it was a good, whether the USS Ford was a good investment? Yeah, not one of her people. comments is how can I help. I consider that disparaging. If she wants to get on board and help, that's absolutely, I, 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 we have open arms. We need everyone to realize that these are massively complex systems. Did we do things wrong? Yes, we did things wrong. We put a price cap on there. I would love to know that, that, that Congress understands what a price cap does. If you were doing business for me and you said, I'm going to paint your house for $100, and I walk up to you and said, oh, the price cap is now 75 what are you going to do? Do a great job and go for the $75? It's probably going to affect how you're going to perform. Well, one of the falls out of that is, did we build the model elevator on land to test it? And I love the fact that 
and I'm going to be very aggressive here, that Congress turns around and says, Navy, this is your fault. I have an extra seat up there when I testify, and I have not seen Huntington Ingalls Newport News called up on the Hill to testify on the outrage that my board of directors sees on the fort. Let's have open, transparent conversations. Well, thank you for an open and transparent conversation. Thanks to all of you for your great questions, and really join me in thanking the Secretary. Thank you all very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.